Well, hey friends, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Well, I hope you're ready for Christmas because it's almost here, believe it or not. I want to begin tonight by reading to you Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Here's what it says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now that's a very familiar and a very precious passage for us who believe. But if you ask the average person what the meaning of Christmas is, you're probably going to get a lot of different answers. But for Christians, we all know that it's really all about Jesus. Because Christmas really doesn't mean a whole lot without Jesus. Now, we've looked at several prophetic names that we celebrate at Christmas, from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and chapter 7 and verse 14. But you know, of all the names that have been given to our Savior, the name Jesus is the most common, it's the most powerful name, and perhaps it's the most important of all of his names. It actually explains what Christmas is all about more than any of the other names, and then some. Now, this name, Jesus, is our English translation from the Greek name, Jesus. The Hebrew name is Joshua, as we pronounce it, or Yeshua, but it literally means Jehovah is salvation. And so many of our hymns and our worship songs, they recognize the beauty and the purpose and the power of the name Jesus. They exalt his great name. Bernard of Clairvaux, he once wrote, No voice can sing, nor heart can frame, nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Savior of mankind. And to us, indeed, it's a beautiful name. It's an extraordinary name because of who it represents. And even though it was a very common name in that day, it's still very special to us for several reasons. First of all, it's special because it identifies him with us. He was given a name just like the rest of us have been given a name. Even though God the Father chose this name, Jesus was still his human name. Now, last week we saw him as Emmanuel, which means God with us. But this baby grew and became a man. He, he lived among us as one of us. So as a man, there is nothing about the human condition that he has not personally experienced except sin. Now you may recall before he began his ministry, Jesus came to John to be baptized. And John's baptism was a, a baptism of repentance. Now, if Jesus didn't sin, he, he really didn't need to repent. But he was baptized so that he could identify with a sinful humanity. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us, But we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, as far as temptations go, Satan hit him with everything that he had. And yet he remained free from sin, unlike us. Now, with some of us, he doesn't have to do very much to get us to sin. But Jesus was able to withstand and resist every single temptation that he faced. 
He was the only sinless man that ever lived. Which is why he was able to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of others. He was our sinless substitute. All of us, at one time or another, we've all given into temptation. And therefore, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every human being. And that reminds us of another reason why this name is so special. And that is, it reminds us of our great need. Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. The angel said he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus himself also said for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. His very name implies that you and I were lost because of our sin. Isaiah chapter 64 verses 6 and 7 they are crystal clear that not one single human being has any kind of goodness or righteousness of his own. Listen to what he says. He says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 confirm what Isaiah has said. It says that there is none righteous, no not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no not one. And Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the fact that our hearts were so desperately in need was why God sent his son Jesus. And sometimes when people hear that name, the Holy Spirit will use it to bring conviction of sin. There's something about his name that can bring people to their knees in repentance and faith. And they recognize that in that name there is hope and forgiveness and salvation. But unfortunately, many will resist and rebel because they don't want to change. Because they like their sin. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 19 that men love darkness because their deeds are evil. So they don't want anything to do with the light. And I know about that because that's where I used to be. And I'm so thankful that God opened my eyes and showed me the light. But then there really is the vast majority of people. People who just prefer to remain indifferent to who Jesus is. Because they think they're okay. To them, Jesus is just a good man. He's a good role model. He's a good teacher. Or they think he's a myth or a fantasy. For them, Christmas is all about peace on earth. Happy holidays. It's about family and food and presents. And maybe they're just a little bit more favorable towards a more secular Christmas. But isn't isn't it ironic, though, that all the efforts to remove Jesus from Christmas only prove just how sinful a human heart can really be? And so thirdly, my friends, this name speaks of his mission. In Jesus' name, there is salvation. There is eternal life only in the name of Jesus. The angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sin. He came to earth for a mission. When Peter was asked by the Jewish authorities in Acts chapter 4, by what name or by what authority he was preaching and doing these incredible miracles and seeing people saved, He said, it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. And then in in verse 12 of chapter 4, he said, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There was a direct link between the name of Jesus and the work that he was sent to do. Jesus spoke frequently of the work that God had sent him for. And when he prayed in John chapter 17, before he was betrayed and arrested, knowing he was about to go to the cross, he said to his father, I have glorified you on the earth. 
I have finished the work which you have given me to do. He said, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, Jesus was born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law. But he had to obey it without failure so that he could redeem us. Because you see, if Jesus had failed in just one area of the law, then he would have become a sinner just like all of us. That's all it would have taken. An infraction of one law, one sin. All he had to commit was one sin and he would have been disqualified to save anybody. In pursuit of his mission, he had to live a perfectly righteous life. And that's what he did. The Bible says he always did those things that pleased his father. And he glorified him and absolutely everything he said and did. You know, they tried to accuse him of sin. They tried to accuse him of blasphemy. They paid men to lie. They accused him of these things. They said that he sinned. But they had to pay men. To, they had to bribe him. Because he never did anything in violation of God's holy law. Even when the pressure of the coming crucifixion began to bear down on him, he said, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. And that pressure mounted, and, and the weight of his mission began to increase as the cross drew near, and he fell on his face, and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And, and, and so he finished what God had given him to do. And just before he died, he cried out, it's finished. It's over. Redemption is complete. The price has been paid in full. Mission accomplished. Think of the enormity of what he did. All of our sin, all of my sin, past, present, and future, from the smallest sin to the greatest sin, no matter how wicked the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse it. The writer of Hebrews says this, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The coming of Jesus brings peace with God and forgiveness of sins to those who receive him. But now, friends, to those who reject him or remain indifferent, dear people, condemnation will be your fate. For those who choose to remain unchanged by Jesus, hope will become a fading reality and judgment becomes more certain. Someone has said that smiling cherubic child had a glimmer of wrath in his eyes. And it's sad that one of the tragedies of the Christmas message is not simply that Jesus would die on a cross for sinners, but that he would die on the cross in order to rescue a sinful human race of which the majority would refuse to be rescued. My friends, if you're a believer, that reality should break your heart. So many people are going to reject the truth of the gospel. And they will be condemned for eternity. My friends, there's a fourth thing that I want to mention about the name of Jesus in closing. And that is that one day every knee shall bow to the name of Jesus. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Every one of us must decide what we will do with Jesus while we can. Because there's coming a day when you'll have no choice. You can listen to the word of God and the spirit of God today and believe that Jesus, in, that in Jesus Christ your sins will be forgiven and you can have eternal life. 
Or you can keep on believing in yourself, keep on believing in your own goodness, in your own understanding of God. But the God of heaven has made it absolutely crystal clear by sending his son, Jesus, that unless you come to God in the manner that he prescribes, in the manner that he declares, unless you come his way, you can't come at all. If you don't come to him today for salvation, and if you die in your sins without Christ, then my friend, there will come a day of judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 says, But now once at the end of the ages he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart for sin, from sin for salvation. And my friends, if you won't bow to him today and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior, one day you will bow to him and face him as your judge. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and of those in heaven, and of those on, on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Call on him today if you've not done that. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never done that, please, would you do that today? I promise that if you do, it'll be a Christmas like you've never had before. Just simply acknowledge before the Lord that you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself. You have no righteousness of your own. Call out to him for mercy. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sin and that he rose again three days later. And just simply say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. I repent. I believe that you died for me, and that you rose again three days later. Save me. Have mercy on me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. I pray that you would do that. Pray with me as we close. Precious Lord, I pray that you would speak to those who have yet to believe. Draw them to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May they call on his name today. May we who know the Lord Jesus love him more. May we serve him more faithfully. May we obey him more consistently. May we worship him more intensely. And may this Christmas be all the more joyful because we have a friend in Jesus. And we ask this together in Jesus' name. Well, thank you for joining me. I pray that all of you would have a blessed Christmas. So Merry Christmas and Lord willing, we'll see you again. Goodbye.